Now, we all believe in praise and worship. I, you wouldn't be here if you didn't. We all believe in praise and worship, but we don't all approach it exactly the same way. Everybody wasn't at the same moment in this service, probably most of the time. You were in different places. Sometimes you were out of this room somewhere else, thinking about other things. We're all in a little bit different place. So we all have a different feeling about the various things we do. Some like one type singing, some like the other, some like one type preaching, some like the other, some like one type prayer, some like the others. You know, it's like that. That's the nature of it. An old farmer went to uh, the big city church, and when he got back, his uh, wife asked him, well, how was it? He said, well, it was good. They did something different, however. They sang praise choruses instead of hymns. She said, praise courses? What are those? He said, well, uh, they're okay. They're, they're sort of like hymns, only different. He said, well, well, what's the difference? He said, well, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, well, well that would be a hymn. But if, on the other hand, I were to say to you, Martha, 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 oh, Martha, 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 the cows, the big cows, the brown cows, the black cows, the white cows, the black and white cows, the cows, 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 cows are in the corn. Then if I were to repeat the whole thing two or three times, well, that would be a praise chorus. That same Sunday, a young Christian from Big City Church came to the small country church and went back home and his wife said well how was it he said well it was good but they did something different however they sang instead of regular songs they sang hymns she said hymns what's a hymn so well they're okay they're sort of like regular songs only different well what's the difference so, well, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, well, that would be a regular song. But if, on the other hand, I were to say to you, oh, Martha, dear Martha, hear thou my cry, inclinest thine ear to the words of my mouth, Turn thou thy whole wondrous ear by and by to the righteous, glorious truth. For the way of the animals who can explain, there in their heads is no shadow of sense. Hearkenest thou in God's son in, or his reign, unless from the mild tempting corn they are fenced. Yea, those cows and glad bovine rebellious delight have broke free their shackles, their warm pins askewed. Then goaded by minions of darkness and night, they all my mild Chilliwack sweet corn chewed. So look to that bright shining day by and by where all foul corruptions of earth are reborn, where no vicious animal makes my soul cry, and I no longer see those foul cows in the corn. Then if I were to do only one verse or three or four verses and change the key on the last verse, well, that would be a hymn. <laughs> I think uh, we all have a different view. I think the thing is, is that we tend to think our way of doing it is it. And that's a mistake, don't you think? Don't you think? Our strength, I think, in the churches of Christ is that our worship is authorized and it's very scriptural. Our weakness at the same time is that we're often very stoic and dead and robotic in the way that we often approach the way we worship. That you rarely see a tear and you rarely hear a joy or an amen very loud. If the Lord had condemned the whole wide world through one person's sins, would we not have a reason to get emotional? Would we not have a reason to weep and mourn? Korah, I think, is a type of Adam. In Numbers 16, 22, it says, O oh God, shall one man sin, and you be angry with all the congregation? Well, that's what happened. 
Adam sinned, and God was mad with us all. Achan was a type of Adam. In Joshua chapter 7, he sinned, stole some things he shouldn't have taken, and so the whole congregation of Israel was defeated at Ai. This one man sinned, and everybody pays. It's happened. So it can happen. So I think that's a reason to mourn, but if at the same time the Lord found a way to save the whole world through one person's acts, would that not be reason to also be emotional and to shout and rejoice? Would it not be great? I, I, and by the way, the Lord has done that through types already. There's a gentleman called Noah who's a type of the Christ. The whole world was thinking evil, but according to Genesis 6 and verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And there was a fellow named Joseph. The whole world was starving to death, to death virtually. The famine went throughout the whole world, and let, but the Lord found a way to save the world through one man's act called Joseph. In Genesis 15 verse 20 it says, You meant evil, talking to his brothers, but God meant it for good in order to save many people alive. So, we have learned that we're saved by faith through grace in Christ alone. I think that's a reason to rejoice. And, it, and what's really interesting is, I believe that's what Romans 5 is about. I believe Romans 5 is about, he just laid on us probably the greatest truth we've ever seen. And we just struggled with it. But we didn't rejoice in it. And so he takes chapter 5 to give you some reasons to rejoice in it. So let's walk our way through that. How about that, okay? And see if we can rejoice in it. Let's rejoice over the great expectations of God's justification. I'm just going to read verse 1 again. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes into some different ways that that's true. We rejoice in God's hope. God's hope for us. The hope of glorification that we share with them. In verse 2 it says, We have access by faith into grace into which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. God has given us hope. We didn't have hope before Jesus. We had guests. We have hope now. Hope is anticipation. We anticipate being saved and we anticipate it through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have hope that God will glorify all of us and bring us to whatever that is, that glorified state. We have that hope. And you, nobody can deny it. Somebody says, well, I don't believe you have any hope. There's nothing beyond the grave. No, you may not have any hope, but we have hope. Amen. We have hope. And there's the hope of tribulation. So maybe I'm going through trouble. Maybe you're going through trouble and things are rough and rocky in your life right now. That's okay because we still have hope of tribulation. It says in verses 3 and 4. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. We glory in it. We praise God over our tribulation knowing that tribulation produces it produces, it results in something. These tribulations that happen to a believer do not happen by accident. They come on us for purpose and they produce things. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. So one of the things, when you're in the middle of all your tribulations, you have hope that that's working for you. A good end. Amen? So it doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. There's no reason to go, oh, woe is me. There is a, oh, it hurts, but praise the Lord, it's working for my glory, this tribulation that I'm in. And then we have the hope of transformation. He says in verse 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We have hope of transformation because we believe the Holy Spirit lives within us. Amen? We believe that God has come to live within us and made his abode within us. Not that we deserve that either. That's by faith through grace. There's no person here so clean that they deserve the Holy Spirit to live within them. But God has granted us his Holy Spirit and within us he has totally transformed us. How did he do it? He poured out love into our heart. We were some of the meanest people on the planet, just like anybody else, until God's Holy Spirit poured in our heart love. We love each other. We're as weird and different a group as you'll ever find, praise the Lord. Bell Shoals is just as odd and strange as you'll ever find anywhere, amen? 
You ought to look in the mirror if you don't believe that's true. Every one of us, we're just destroyed. But the Lord has transformed us. We still love each other. Amen? And that's, a, that's the blessed hope of knowing that God has transformed us. So in exulting, let's rejoice over the expectations of God's justification that he is glorifying us and he's bringing us through tri tribulations and he is transforming us. Let's rejoice also over the great expression of God's reconciliation. He is reconciling us, bringing us back to himself. Verse 11 says, And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. It's not something we look forward to. We are already reconciled. Isn't that good? It's already been done. We have been reconciled. If you've ever done any work in your uh, little uh, book with your bank, You've had to reconcile, get things right. We've already been reconciled. We're made right right now. So we rejoice in God's reconciliation, and he did that in and out of love. Wow. That means that God loves you in a powerful way, and you should rejoice in it. How much does he love you? He loved you when you were absolutely insufficient. You were not what you ought to be. You were totally weak. You couldn't, even, you couldn't even lift your mind to think about becoming a Christian when the Lord was working on this because you didn't even have a mind. You didn't even exist when God was working this out for you. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And even if you'd been living at the time of Christ, you wouldn't have been able to come up with the idea of what God was going to do. God came up with this all on his own. He produced it all by himself. And he gave it to you by himself. And you were totally insufficient to do anything powerful to accommodate yourself and to be saved. You say, well, I believe you're going to obey the gospel. whoop de doo Somebody can duck me underwater and thereby I've earned salvation. What a ridiculous thought. It's not even, well, I go to church. Oh, wow, that makes up for all the evil I've done. Wow. Uh, no, sir, no, ma'am. That's not the way it works. So love was poured out upon us when we were totally insufficient. Love was poured out upon us when we were being insubordinate. So when you're not really living your life the way you should right now, often you'll say, well, God will turn his back on me. Folks, God's not like that. He's not like you and me. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says, verse 8, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you when you were sinning like you never would believe. And you sit there and you say, well, well, I did wrong this week. I hope he hadn't turned his back on me. Are you crazy? That's not even within his realm of thinking. He is in the realm of don't turn your back on me. He's not turning his back. The question is, are you turning your back? God's not going to turn his back on you. His love is even for the ones being insubordinate right at this moment. If you're sitting right there right now and you don't even want to be here, he still loves you. He still loves you. And then he's, the love for the insolent, the ones that have an attitude. Look at verse 10. He says, for if when we were enemies, that means your heart was against God. We were enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled shall we be saved by his life. So even when our hearts were against God, God was loving us. So if you're sitting there today and you think, well, I've just been too bad and I just don't. That very thought means uh, God still loves you. God still loves you. And you don't need to be. So you should rejoice in that. I'm telling you, we ought to be rejoicing. Exulting, let's rejoice over the great expectation of God's reconciliation that we already have. Not one day we'll have. We have reconciliation right now. God has made us right with him. And you say, well, but my attitude's wrong. My, my thoughts are wrong. I've done wrong this week. That's right. But if his love was that great before he even knew you, now that you are his son, do you think he would dare turn away from you? Third lesson. Let's rejoice over the great explanation 
of God's salvation. Now, God didn't have to explain how he saved us. He didn't have to. But isn't it great that he did? Don't you find that fascinating? That the great God of heaven and earth would bow himself down and say, well, let me explain to you how I did it. Isn't that good? Let me just tell you how I did it. And here it is. He, he begins in verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now, what he does here in this little text is he gives you a couple of three different ideas that make perfect sense. Now, don't you just follow with me now. How did the world go bad? Through one man. So when somebody says, I don't understand justification. He said, because that's just one guy. Well, how did it get in the mess to begin with? Just one guy. One guy put us in this mess. Why couldn't one guy fix this mess? It actually makes perfect sense when you really think it through. If one man's guilt could result in judgment for all, then one man's gift of himself could result in justification for all. If not, why not? I mean, you can have one way and have the other, right? But two, he says, if one man's offense could result in death for all, because death passed on all men, and as a result, all men sinned, but death passed upon us all. Do you know anybody that's gotten out of this world without dying? Death passed upon us all. Then one man's offering could result in life for all. What are we talking about? We're not talking about life in this world because that's been fixed. But the life in the next world, the eternal life, can be ours through the death of one. So if one man's disobedience could result in sinfulness for all, in other words, the whole world became sinful, and that nobody would deny, the whole world, then one man's obedience could result in righteousness for the entire world. That's right. In other words, he can make all righteous if they will just receive it. Amen. How simple can it be? And God explained it to you. If you say, well, I don't understand it. I think you do. It's just maybe it's not something you want it to be. But you should be able to get this. So exalting, we need to ex get excited. In my opinion, we ought to rejoice over the explanation that God's given us. So here it is. This is the whole thing. We ought to be rejoicing over the expectation of hope of this justification that God's provided. We ought to be excited about what God's going to do with us, whether we're right now talking about going to heaven or whether we're talking about getting through the trouble we're in or whether we're talking about having love come out of our heart and let's be more. We ought to be excited about the love that's been expressed to us, that we're already reconciled and God has loved us when we were really bad. So how could he not love us when we're being pretty good? Amen. How could he not love us right now? So if you're doubting where you are, you ought to know that God loves you right now. And then we ought to rejoice in the explanation that God has made it so clear how he made that possible. What's the significance of that? Well, Roman, I mean, Psalm 107 verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We ought to say it. Amen. I, I just, our strength is, yes, our worship is scriptural and authorized and all that, but our weakness is, we're a pretty stoic bunch. We, we really are kind of robotic at times. Let me walk you through some words here. Uh, these are Matt uh, Crocker, Joel Houston, and Ben Tinnikoff. Uh, they did the song Scandal of Grace. Some of you know this song. It says, Grace, what have you done? Murdered for me on that cross. Accused in absence of wrong, my sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place so my soul will live. Oh, to be like you. To give all I have just to know you, Jesus. There's no one besides you. Forever the hope in my heart. Death, where is your sting? Your power is dead as my sin. The cross has taught me to live and mercy my heart now to sing. The day and its trouble shall come. I know that your strength is enough. The scandal of grace, you died in my place so my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, to give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one besides you forever, the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you, to give all that I have.
just to know you. Jesus, there's no one besides you forever, the hope in my heart, and it's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of you, Jesus. It's all because of your love that my soul will live. Oh, to be like you. To give all I have just to know you, Jesus. There's no one beside you forever, the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you. To give all I have just to know you, Jesus. There's no one beside you forever, the hope in my heart. I don't believe that you can engage in worship without engaging your emotions. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Richard Stern, president of World Vision, visited a church in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, about a year after the devastating hurricane, uh, not hurricane, uh, earthquake that hit there a few years ago. Uh, they were worshiping in a church that was made out of white tarp and duct tape provided by the UN. It's a camp of thousands there. You can't see it behind those words, but there's a camp of nothing but white tents behind that. In the front row of that church sat six amputees from 6 to 60. The worship was full of hope, he said, and thanksgiving. No one was singing louder than the name of that lady you see right there, Des Moines Lapine. She's a 32-year-old unemployed single mother of two. A collapsed building crushed her right leg, right arm and her left leg, excuse me. And a few days later, they had to amputate both. She was in that serv service, standing on her prosthetic limb, lifting her other hand in praise. She lived in a tent just five feet tall and eight feet wide. She had lost her job, her home, two limbs, and she was trying to get by, trying to take care of two kids. Yet, she was rejoicing more than anybody virtually there. She said, he brought me back like Lazarus and gave me the gift of life. And she was ecstatic about it. What she said about it. You know, the God who made the mountains, the God who made the oceans, the God who made all the lakes and the rivers and the trees and the animals, the God who made the stars, the God who who made the galaxies, after he got through making all those things, said he wanted more. He wanted you. He wanted you. That's right. It wasn't finished until he had you here. You feel that? He wanted you here. What did he want to do with you? He wanted to feed you. And he had. He wanted to clothe you, and he has. He wanted to let you get sick and call upon him and him heal you, and he has. He wanted to give you a family, and he has. He wanted to give you a family that loved you, and he has. He wanted to let you fail and then forgive you, and he has. He wanted to save you. See, all of that other stuff he made was not complete until he got you. And so we come to church, and that was all for you, and I just can't see coming to church and it not be emotional to you. I don't see it. I, I don't see how we can be saved by grace and not be filled with awe. I don't, I don't think how we can sit here and we can go through a service week after week and all it be is just like water off of a duck's back. I don't see it. Do you? Am I missing something here? How is it that it isn't deeper and more profound? How is it that you don't just sit and just weep for the grace of God? Display your joy. If you're here today, you have an opportunity. If you haven't given your life to the Lord, you've got an opportunity. God's granted you one more day. 
You could repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, be baptized today. God's granted you that great gift right today. You could make it all right. There's no one here that need to go away not right with God. Amen? There's absolutely no reason. We'll wait on you. We'll wait till the last one. If, if every person here needs to come forward, we will take care of that. But if you're sitting here and you've just, you've got it. You, you know you're reconciled to God. Then make a commitment. I will never, ever, ever, ever go to church and it be unemotional again because I do recognize what the Lord of glory has done for me through faith in the grace of Jesus Christ. I will never come here and just sit stoically while everybody else sings, while everybody else prays, while everybody engages. I will have my heart here. I will lay it on the altar before the Lord. And at least that one day, it will mean something to me. If you're committed to that, then commit to it now and never come back here unemotional again. But if you have never given your life, this is the chance you've waited for. Won't you come right now as we stand and sing?